Whatever you say, say nothing when you talk about you know what. For if you know should hear you, you know what you'll get. They'll take you off to you know where and you wouldn't know how long. So for you know who's sake, don't let anyone hear you singing this song. This first person film, set in the 1950s, reminds us how Catholic grammar schools insisted on blind obedience. The system was a bully, thriving on parents and children being shamed into silence. The author's answer was resistance, mocking his tormentors as the twisted paper tigers they were. Starting as early as five years old, he fought against their unfairness and found standing up for yourself was its own reward. But those powers insisted on whatever you say, say nothing. My first fight was with a guy way above my weight class, more than 100 pounds. I was five years old, he was 40. I was a skinny malink, a tall drink of water. They said, he looks just like his father. Will I be fat like him? I wisecracked. Offended, my father socked me in the skull. There was thunder and lightning and rumbling in my eyes and the smell of ammonia in my nose. My five-year-old legs wobbled, but I would not go down. Not that I thought I could win, but I refused to go down. As my mom often said, there's no sense being Irish if you're not going to be stubborn. Events like these stick out like painful peaks in the humdrum daily slaps and natural shocks the flesh was heir to in my Sullivan clan. Without warning, my father would grab me from behind and tap my head on our brick fireplace, as if he was playing with me, like a cat plays with a mouse he's about to dispatch. My oldest brother, Richie, recalled, he also picked on the same weak spots over and over, violently squeezing my scrawny neck or my collarbone or flicking my forehead with his finger, which felt like a club. When I was eight, I was still under 100 pounds, I was sitting in our family ritual, a semicircle of seven kids on the floor watching TV. I made a wisecrack about something on the tube. As my fellow siblings tittering subsided, a baritone growl rose from my father's recliner. Terms! Evidently the censor was offended. Go to bed! What could my eight-year-old mind have come up with that so offended my father? I obediently rose, but quickly added, picky, picky, as if to say, it's just a joke. Again, my siblings tittered, that chuckling in church kind of laughter. Amid the tittering, the ominous sound, kalump, the thumping footrest on the recliner. He erupted like an Irish Catholic volcano, spewing rage and lava all over the room. My six siblings disappeared in the smoke, floating on molten flows. Perched on the first step of the stairs, lava lapping at my feet, I choked on the smoke, roiling off the ceiling and filling the room as it gushed from my father's ears. Ernst! 
He flew across the room on Old Testament archangel wings, Frederick Church clouds tumbling behind him, cumulus nimbusly. As he landed on top of me, he struck me with a thunderclap shot to my forehead. My skull bounced off the stairs. I put up the Floyd Patterson peekaboo defense, fists and forearms against your head and your chest, crying out loud, I don't care how much you hit me, I'm not crying. A short pause was followed by a volley of body shots with his big bony hands, and all I did was grunt. He stopped with a slap to the right temple, which I rolled with and ran up the stairs. I did not cry. I'm not crying anymore. That was the first time I said those words and they became a credo for the rest of my life. I will resist. You will not crush me. And don't try to make an example out of me. It will backfire on you like a firecracker that goes off in your hand. All of my stories are about resisting people, abusing power, and proving you can resist and win those battles for yourself. I gladly paid the price for my resistance because my payback was standing up for myself and saying, you don't have to cower. These people are paper tigers. I prove this in every one of my stories. Fight back against people abusing power against you. You will live to laugh and write and sing about it. While working with Pete Seeger for more than two decades, we agreed Everyone owns the right to be treated fairly, with dignity. We would often sing about it with this song. My life flows on in endless song Above earth's lamentations I hear the real, though far off him that hails a new creation. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging, since love is Lord of heaven and earth. How can I keep from singing? When tyrants tremble in their fear And hear their death knell ringing When friends rejoice both far and near How can I keep from singing? In prison cell and dungeon vile Our thoughts to them are winging when friends by shame are undefiled. How can I keep from singing? How can I keep from singing? Paul and Silas bound in jail. It had no money for to go to bail. Keep your eyes on that prize. Hold on, hold on. Even though I was still in the army and stuck in their stockade, I tried to stay positive. I had an opportunity to join a Denver commune that was moving to Hawaii. It was waiting for me. All I had to do was get out of the army and their hard rock hotel. Months before my stay in jail, I made fast friends with some like-minded artists and craftspeople. They had a plan that already made money by creating and selling handmade wooden animals for kids. And they were moving it to Hawaii. 
Bill and Irma, an older couple, 60-ish, were the de facto parents who ran the commune like a benevolent family. They agreed to take me on as a worker bee. I had showed them I could handle the rudimentary details of sawing and sanding and finish work. Matter of fact, Irma's rave review of my work, he'll do. It was hard getting a compliment from Brooklyn-born Irma. Oh, also, Bill and Irma knew an excellent lawyer who took my case when I told the Army I wanted to exercise my right to use a civilian lawyer because my brother Richard advised me when you took the option of the Army assigned lawyer, they weren't really lawyers. They were masquerading as lawyers. Richie, for instance, had a liberal arts degree and they would assign him to defend soldiers at course marshals. The soldiers had no idea why they were stuck with an artillery officer as their lawyer. It was just because he was an officer. In the army, you were frequently reminded there was the right way, the wrong way, and the army way. And you will, without question, do it the army way. I had my own ideas about that. I think the blind obedience required there was part of the uniform mindset. If we all look the same, then we'll all think the same. No. So get with the program, Private Sullivan. I didn't. Very first thing that I did right was the day that I began to fight. Keep your eyes on that prize. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on that prize and hold on, hold on. Now, my lawyer, Mr. Leonard Davies, made an aggressive case for the violation of my civil rights. Whereas Captain Norman D. Strange, Provo Marshal of Fitzsimmons General Hospital did with malice aforethought direct MP Private Thomas Farrell to place Private Sullivan in a cell, unguarded, alone with prisoner George Martin, who had recently murdered his company commander and his first sergeant in Vietnam. Mr. Martin weighed 275 pounds and standing six foot five was transferred to the jail because the psychiatric ward found him too dangerous to be left with the patients on the closed ward. And they didn't have enough staff to handle him. This transfer, however, is in violation of patient prisoner rights under Army Regulation DD398. The prisoner, Mr. Martin, was described as a combative African American young man with homicidal, suicidal tendencies and he had already attacked Private Sullivan before Captain Strange so ordered the MP. He said, according to prior testimony before this tribunal, put him inside with Big George. Private Sullivan will be just fine. He says he loves these Negroes. Let's see how they get along. In further testimony, the MP asked the captain if he should stand at the entrance to the cell block for security. Captain Strange replied, No, Private Farrell. 
It's a case of mind over matter. I don't mind, and he don't matter. Mr. Davies persuaded M.P. Farrell to return from civilian life and testify against the Provo Marshal about breaking the Army's rules. I don't know how Leonard horse-traded the charges that got me in jail originally. AWOL, disobeying orders, insubordination. But the tribunal trying me seemed to defer to him when he went to the sidebar with them. He thought it might be his local reputation. He was famous in Denver for defending a guy who rented a room in our commune's house, Lauren Watson. He was the head of the Black Panthers in Denver. Davies got him out of jail and exonerated after he was framed for murder by a cop who was later found guilty of that murder. After that sidebar, Leonard said to me, all of those crap charges against you, they're dropped. I've got them thinking about the bigger picture, securing the rights of the next soldier that steps foot in Captain Strange's constitutional hellhole. I don't know what they had in mind for you, but there's a lieutenant colonel at that table. That's like bringing a cannon to a six-gun pistol fight. It may be that notoriety I got from the Lauren Watson case and the Army doesn't want any more bad publicity getting out into the civilian world. Like a cracker from Texas running a stockade using a homicidal African-American young man who's a psychiatric patient killing a liberal white boy from New York for his entertainment. Sound familiar? I've convinced these lawyers Captain Strange is an accident waiting to happen and an embarrassment to their legal system. So instead of making an example out of you, they are now seeing Captain Strange as a liability. Leonard Davies brought a civilian perspective to these army officers, reminding them that the world outside of 1968 was awash in racial tension, like a tightly wound spring, and there was no telling when it would snap or who would get hit with the metal shards. Captain Strange made the mistake of assuming the courts martial officers were on his side when he said, well, as fellow officers, we frequently have to grease the skids on the rules, making gentlemen's agreements sometimes. That one sentence had him confessing to his own infractions and hanging the psychiatrist major along with him. He was so used to everybody going along with his rule bending. He thought he was covered by the usual different spanks for different ranks rule, which lets officers off with a slap on the wrist. That enabled Davies to prove that my eight-week stay in the psychiatric ward was ordered by Captain Strange as punishment from a non-medical officer, thereby proving Strange broke another Army regulation. It was an unofficial swap he made with the Major in charge of the psychiatric ward for allowing Mr. Martin to be housed in the captain's jail. I couldn't believe my luck. Davies secured my GI Bill of Rights and I'd left the army 
with a general discharge, which automatically turns into an honorable in six months. By shining a more objective civilian light on this dark corner of the army, Davies might have stopped the twisted mentality of this provo from taking the life of another prisoner. Three days later, I was on a plane to Hawaii. Those plans I made months before made for a very convenient escape from this hostile environment. You see, the very moment I thought I was lost, the dungeon shook and the chains fell off. Keep your eyes on that prize and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on that prize, hold on, hold on. After I got out of the army, and went to Hawaii, I never stopped resisting a normal path and could not keep from singing, which led me to sing Hold On with Pete Seeger. Here's an example of Pete and I singing together. I have a friend who makes his living as a plumber, uh, lives way down in Long Island, but I found he knew some Irish songs that none of us have ever heard before. And I'm going to ask Terry Sullivan if he'd come out here and lead us all. Thank you. Pete. Shall we do Oro Shea, Pete? Okay. Okay. Shall we teach it to them? This is the only one that I know. <laughs> you can all learn it. Yeah, all of you can learn it. The first phrase repeats three times, so by the time you're at the end of the phrase, you'll learn it, right, Pete? Right. Oro, oro, she de vaha walia. She de vaha walia. Yeah, you got it. See, you didn't think you were going to get it, did you? No. Oro, she de vaha walia. You're a very quick learner. <laughs> All right, one more time. Oro, she de vaha walia. Anish er hyakt und sauri. They go that slowly. Yeah. Anish is now. Anish er hyakt er hyakt und sauri. Und sauri. Now that summer is here, so it's oro she da What does that mean? Three times. That means welcome. 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 Welcome, Welcome, now that summer is here. And that's what you're going to be singing to this melody. See, you got it. Yeah. Oh, I'll try one more time. We'll sing it together. Spanish, 
to spare the wife or neuter me before I'd let him away with that big ob I'd show him me pedigree I'd put up a hell of a fight and wouldn't it be a sight to see one strategic nip the neuterer becoming the neutery oh, 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 oh if I was a dog I'd have me dead oh, 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 oh wouldn't I be wagging me tail now sooner or later I'd father a litter and teach the little ones how to be. And if any of them tried to get smart, big up, I'd chase a lot of them up a tree. So if you're walking along the street, an elegant dog you happen to see, strutting it out, give us a shout. You could be you, and that could be me. <laughs> oh, if I was a dog, I'd have me dead. Oh, wouldn't I be wagging me tail? One more time. Oh, if I was a dog, I'd have me dead. Oh, wouldn't I be wagging me tail? I guess. Thank you, Terry. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, get me down, push me around. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. I'm gonna keep on talking, keep on walking, shine my light on down. 